We're joined now by the Prime Minister of Ukraine, Denis Shmihal, who is here in Brussels having a lot of important discussions with a lot of people. I'd like to begin, Prime Minister, if you could just tell me what are the kinds of things you're talking about while you're here in Brussels? And concretely, what do you want from EU leaders this week? Thank you so much for hosting me. And as every year, we have today Association Council uh, European Union Ukraine. So it's a traditional meeting uh, annually. Uh, we discuss all the issues for our association. Uh, and now uh, this is membership uh, issues. Uh, we discuss all important uh, points. Uh, three, the main points is finances weaponry and actually our integration into the European Union. So about finances, we have uh, crucial support from European mm. Union for these two years of full scale aggression, more than 88 billion euros for uh, support uh, Ukrainian budget, Ukrainian military needs, Ukrainian humanitarian needs. So half of this amount uh, is for actually budget and humanitarian support. Uh, 28 billion is for military support. Mm -hmm. Now we have uh, uh, Ukraine Assistance uh, Fund. This is a part of a European uh, Peace Fund, Peace Instrument. And uh, this is 5 billion for this year. And for next four years, it will be the same level, I believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 billion for the four years. This is instrument for military support of Ukraine and uh, our European aspiration, our uh, European path. So we discuss all the issues for uh, implementation uh, of Ukraine and integration of Ukraine in all European uh, markets, in all European institutions. So I believe that we will do our homework work and we'll uh, move forward together with European colleagues. And so I'd like to unpack some of those points precisely. So on the question of accession into the EU, there has been discussion about a partial um, acceptance first. Do you have a clear idea from the EU what that looks like? What benefits would come with a partial accession? And do you have an idea of a timeline? So uh, we do not discuss partial accession. Uh, we discuss uh, integration of Ukraine into the European markets. Mm -hmm. Now we are on our uh, path to go into the negotiations with the European Union. And we hope that in June we will open uh, this negotiation uh, process. Uh, and we'll discuss all 35 uh, chapters of uh, European negotiation process. Uh, we also uh, discuss that uh, Ukraine uh, have made uh, our homework mm -hmm. in perfect way. So we are very fast uh, moving. Uh, because so once there's willingness is, on the European side, you think it's it will go very quickly? Uh, from our side, yeah. we would like to finish negotiation process uh, yeah. for two years and then uh, give the ball on the uh, side of European partners for political decision about uh, our membership. So actually, this is our goal and this is our strategy. And, and one of the main issues also that will be discussed in the meeting tomorrow with the EU leaders is this question of Russian assets, frozen assets and the profits that come from it. What have you been told here? Do you think that, that is, there is consensus there in Europe? And when do you think that Ukraine could receive money from those assets? Very important for us uh, question and issue for confiscation of frozen or immobilized Russian assets because aggressor, Russia, uh, terrorist country should be punished and should pay high price for all of these losses, damages, all of these terrible crimes which they caused in Ukraine. So uh, now we are working hard with all G7 partners, with all of our partners mm -hmm. who has, who have uh, this uh, frozen assets, sovereign assets. I uh, emphasize this. Mm -hmm to confiscate all the body of these assets, actually, uh, totally, because it's amount about $300 billion, uh, which could be used for recovery of Ukraine, for compensation all the losses and damages. Now, European Union have made first step, uh, confiscation of revenue of these frozen mm -hmm. Russian assets and usage this for Ukrainian needs, uh, for uh, urgent Ukrainian needs. And we believe that this is only the good sign and only the first step and we continue discussion how legally and politically organize this uh, uh, confiscation of frozen Russian assets. We have two possible ways. Mm -hmm. First, it's con uh, confiscation and usage through the international me uh, compensation mechanism, which include international fund and international commission, which will take decision how to use this. And second pass is uh, usage of this as a guarantees, as a collateral, so-called so so collateral or guarantees from countries which are holding this frozen assets to give possibility Ukraine issue uh, bonds 
and to uh, lend money and uh, actually use it for needs of Ukraine, budget of Ukraine, and uh, recovery of Ukraine. And on the issue of the budget, um, are you going to have a dis- are you going to have discussions with creditors about restructuring debt? Do you have a timeline for that? Actually, now we have restructured a part of our debts, and uh, now is not time for discussion. Okay. So. And there's been a lot of uh, rhetoric changing here in Europe. We heard uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, talking about potentially boots on the ground in Ukraine. We hasten to add that that's not something that Ukraine has asked for. But do you take a message from that? Is there more urgency here in Europe? And also, would you welcome boots in Ukraine from Europe, from Europe even in non-combat uh, capacities? I should say that for the last one and a half year, maybe two years of full-scale aggression, uh, mindset of many European politicians uh, is changed dramatically, and uh, it, it's very good news for all of us because we understand that Russia is uh, aggressor, is terrorist country, and Ukraine now is protecting European borders. So we are very glad that uh, President Macron. Uh, 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 communication is much, much stronger. It's very concrete, very clear. Mm -hmm. And this is what we all need, not just Ukraine, but all European Union. We should be very concrete, very fast, very clear, because the only way to fight and to liberate in this full-scale war with uh, aggression of a terrorist country such Um, as Russia. The $60 billion that's stuck in the House right now in the United States, do you think that that will make it to you? So we have um, assurances from uh, United States Senate because they approved this draft law. So now we are waiting decision of Congress. We have very active dialogue and negotiations with uh, many congressmen uh, mm-hmm. from both uh, parties. We have bilateral uh, and bipartisan support uh, from uh, from the Congress. And I believe that during the nearest time, uh, this month uh, or maximum next month, we will have this good news from United States and United States will join to European Union, to G7 coalition, uh, I mean uh, military and financial support of Ukraine in this uh, battle with uh, Russia. And, and just and, and what does the year look like for Ukraine if the aid does not come from the so United States? Actually, now we have in uh, so we should uh, take a look on both financial and military yeah. issues. So financially, we have uh, IMF program, uh, full-scale program from IMF for the four years. We have Ukraine facility from European Union for the four years. We have support from other G7 and uh, other countries, partner countries, mm-hmm. Norway, Netherlands, uh, Japan support us uh, so much. And it let us uh, survive in the first half of the year. Second half of the year, we count on the American support, so we will need this to cover our budget deficit. And the second uh, pass, second issue is military support. Actually, yeah. this is huge amount, 50 billions per uh, per this 2024 year. Uh, it's crucial for us, for all of us, for uh, Europe, for Ukraine. Uh, we are very grateful to European Union for establishing and launch of this mechanism, uh, Ukraine Assistance Fund, which we will which will cover 5 billion euros per year for uh, military assistance. We are very grateful for Czech initiative to supply to Ukraine uh, 800,000 uh, uh, shells, shells yeah. Yeah. Uh, for artillery. It's crucially important because we need this on the ground, we need this on the front line urgently, uh, just in March or in April, not later, as a part of this uh, and, supply. And another critical issue for you is perhaps also the United States uh, election. We heard from Viktor Orban, who had met with Donald Trump, and this is what he said about him after that meeting, was that Donald Trump will not give a penny in the Ukraine-Russia war. That is why the war will end. What would another Trump presidency mean for Ukraine and for the war? The most important is uh, support of society. So, uh, so American society, European societies support Ukraine so much. So politicians in uh, G7 countries, in uh, many civilized countries, democratic countries, support Ukraine and must support because this is will of their uh, electorate of their society. So we believe that the United States will continue support of Ukraine uh, uh, despite the results of the uh, elections and who will be president. Because the United States is a strong democracy. We are fighting for democratic values, mutual democratic values. Uh, we are together with G7 uh, countries, so I believe that everything will be good and we will continue. But our purpose, our goal is to finish this war mm-hmm as early as possible. So Russia should stop this war and should uh, go out. So because of this, we 
uh, continue uh, propose to use uh, for peace formula of president of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky mm -hmm. to gather uh, uh, forum, uh, peace forum, mm -hmm. uh, on which we invite all the countries where we made took decision, take decision, and uh, to call Russia and pressure Russia to stop this war, not just ceasefire, but stop this war and leave Ukrainian territories. And I think that for the United States, for many people in the United States and politicians in the United States, the way they see the war going, you know, there have been some losses of ter of territory uh, by Ukraine, and that maybe the impression that would change if there are some more victories. So what is needed from a military standpoint right now to reverse momentum and to regain the initiative on the battlefield? I should remember that uh, we liberate 50% of territories which were occupied by Russia since 2402, 22nd year. We liberate Black Sea, so now Black Sea in fact is free and we may export our uh, goods through the sea, uh, Black Sea ports. Uh, we continue destroy Russian techniques and Russian army every day on the front line. So uh, we may win this war, we may liberate our territories with support of our partners, European mm -hmm. Union, United States, uh, G7 countries. So uh, we should uh, continue to protect our countries, our country. We are sovereign country with internationally recognized borders and we can't let Russia to change world uh, or global order, uh, global security order, and we should press them uh, to stop this war and, and leave our territories. And another element that might help to that is this mobilization law that has been debated for a very long time. I believe you're voting on it at the end of the month. Do you think this mobilization law will pass? And how many more soldiers can that put on the battlefield? So uh, now new chief of commander uh, made uh, inventorization and take a look uh, uh, on the situation on the uh, ground, on the front line. Uh, we have reserves inside of our uh, defense and military forces. So now uh, we understand, we begin rotations on the front line. So we understand that we need not so much as it was announced, uh, uh, mob mobilized uh, people and we will uh, continue fight if we will have support from our partners for artillery shells, mm -hmm. for long and middle range uh, missiles. It will let us to go through the pro process with much, much easier conditions mm -hmm. of mobilization and we may uh, go with this draft law or in other way with resolutions or smaller uh, draft laws which will let us to manage the situation uh, with our uh, defense forces. Well, Denis Mihal, the Prime Minister of Ukraine, thank you so much for your time and for speaking with us while you're here in Brussels.